All right. Good morning, everyone. We have gone on a big journey over the last few weeks, the last few months, actually. And uh, in a moment or two, Bill's going to play us a little video clip, but I thought I would just give a little review, especially for those of you who may be here for the first time today. So we started off talking about delay, didn't we? We walked through the desert with the, with the uh, Israelites. We understood God's intentions. We understood that he has tied his leg to us in a three-legged race called the Gospel Commission. We understood that in the grand scheme of God, he has slowed all his processes down to accommodate humanity and to have us join him in his plan. We uh, looked at the concept of salvation, and we've described salvation all the way through this series in very relational terms. We called it the embrace of home, that God steps forward in his grace to embrace us at the cross, and that we step forward in faith to embrace him in return. We've looked at how that embrace, that reconciliation, brings us back into the sphere of influence of God. We receive the Holy Spirit, and His Spirit dwelling in us enables that which we could never do by ourselves. It enables us to come back into harmony with the character of God, with the law of God, with the principles of His governance. We looked at how the salvation would unfold from the cross right down through to our age into the judgment hour. We understood that Christ Jesus still continues to represent us as the heavenly high priest above, that he has gone to prepare a place for us and that he will soon return. We learned that he will return on the clouds of glory. It will be audible. It will be visible. It will be uh, to, to all five of our senses, something which you cannot miss. We learned in this series, Almost Home. That God is the God of love and that all his processes are designed to reveal that he is love, to instill confidence in our hearts so that we will trust him. Whether we can see the good times or whether we're stuck in the darkest hour, we can have confidence because of what he has revealed that he is the God of love and therefore we hold on to him through the darkness and through the trial. We've learned in this series, Almost Home, that he has... Uh, granted to us the Holy Spirit who bestows upon us gifts of the Spirit that we may engage with Him in giving the invitation of reconciliation to others. We've learned that He has spoken to us in these last days through a real life, a real live living prophet. That this, in fact, was one of the identifying marks of a church in the last days that would have as its heritage the true establishment of Christ from the very beginning down through the ages. God has always had a church on earth, an organization that is there for the purpose of representing him in character and giving the invitation to others. And then last night, we culminated the series around the table. And that's the topic for... uh, today that we're going to be looking at as the last one in our series. I'm going to ask Bill, if you're ready, to play our little video so you can see what happened last night. that look good? 
Those of you that were there, you know that we had a blessed time together, a good time of fellowship and of spiritual connection with the Lord. And uh, so today we're talking a little bit more in a little bit more detail about around the table. How many of you have experienced a grumbling or growling stomach? Yes, somewhere around the end of church usually. Did you know that actually the proper name for grumbling, growling stump, stomach is a wham, wambling stomach? Your stomach doesn't growl or grumble, it wambles. <laughs> now, here's another question for you. This word, what does it mean? Dipnophobia. Ever heard of dipnophobia? Dipnophobia is the fear of conversation while eating. It usually, like all phobias, is usually as a result of some kind of traumatic experience at some point in your life. Maybe you went to dinner with someone, you were set up as a blind date, and they turned out to be just horribly obnoxious or intimidating. And it just, you know, completely, it just that, that fear, that experience you went through stays with you, right? Or maybe, maybe you went to dinner with your husband or your wife, and they, they decided to use dinner in a public place as the place to announce a divorce, or something like that, right? Those kind of traumatic experiences. This word, dipnophobia, it, it's sometimes used not only for the fear of conversation around the table, but the outright fear of eating in public surrounded by strangers. And so it's quite incapacitating because people like this will tend to only want to eat by themselves at home in a very controlled environment. In Scripture, a lot of stuff happens around the table. Some of the biggest conversations in Scripture happen around the table. I shared some of this with the crowd last night, but bear with me if you were there. We'll move on to new material in a moment. Number one, do you know that when Jesus was visiting with a certain Pharisee named Simon, a woman walked into the room with a very expensive bottle of perfume. It cost her an entire year's worth of wages. She cracked that bottle open and she poured it all over Jesus' feet. A lavish expense for the worship of Jesus. And when, and when the others rebuked her, Jesus said, ah, ah, ah. What she has done has been in my service. This is an act of worship around the table. Jesus met with tax collectors and sinners around the table. In fact, when you read the gospel, it's one of the things that the religious elite, the scribes and the Pharisees, looked down on him for. They criticized him for, for eating with tax collectors and sinners. But it seems like Jesus had in his mind that something interesting happens around the table. And all were welcome at his table. It's interesting that the first miracle of Jesus when he begins his ministry takes place around a marriage table, right? And the first thing he does is to make more of that unfermented wine. The last thing he does with his disciples before the cross is again he sits with them around the table and there they eat together. He begins his ministry around the table. He ends his ministry around the table. When you read in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 and 2, it has the metaphor of the table, of eating and drinking, as Isaiah's appeal to his generation to return to the Lord. Come, you who are thirsty. Come, you who are hungry. Buy milk, buy wine without cost to you. Come and eat around my table. And then again, what we find in the Laodicean appeal in Revelation chapter 3 is Jesus uses this language appealing to a last day church, an end time people, a church for which he has nothing good to say. The pattern of the seven churches in Revelation is that he begins by giving them accolades, by speaking to them of their positive points of strength before rebuking them for the negatives. There are two churches, one of which is Laodicea, representing our day and our age, for which he has nothing good to say. There is no compliment. And yet he says, come, sit around the table with me. He knows that in our brokenness, he knows that in our emptiness, he knows that in our sinfulness, what we need is the same thing as the tax collectors and the sinners, that we will come and sit around the table with him. Because there's something that happens when you're visiting with the Savior. There's something that happens when you're eating with the Savior. There's something that happens when you're taking the Savior into your being. That's why around the last supper table, he took ordinary bread and ordinary red grape juice and he made it something profoundly spiritual. He took this ordinary substance that 
that they ate every day of their lives before that, that they would continue to eat every day of their life after that. And he takes it and he imbues it with something that it was not something spiritual. His idea was that every time you would sit around the table, after he was gone, after he had ascended, every time they would sit around the table, every time you and I would sit around the table with our families, eating bread and drinking grape juice together, it would remind us of the new covenant of salvation, that we sit not only with one another, but that we sit with the Savior around his table. I want you to ch turn with me to John chapter 13. It's not John chapter 3. It's John chapter 13, and we're looking here at verses 31 to 36. And it says the following. John chapter 13, 31 to 36. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, The time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. Now, Jesus is not talking about his return, right? He hasn't even gone to the cross yet. Jesus is talking about the cross. The cross is his glory. Jesus is about to enter into his glory. How is that so? He's not talking about his ascension. He's talking about his betrayal and his crucifixion. And the reason is very simple. Because at the cross, you see the fullness of the glory of Jesus. At the cross, you see the character of God in laying down his life for the sinful and for the rebellious. For the very ones he came to seek and to save, but who rejected him, who treated him despitefully. That is the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord is not primarily his outward brilliance. It's not merely the appearance of power. The glory of the Lord is his character. And that's interesting because that means that in the hour that looks like greatest defeat, in the hour that is his greatest humiliation, it is also the hour of his greatest glory. Because anyone with a discerning eye standing at the cross will see what the Roman centurion saw. Surely this man is the son of God. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will soon give glory to the Son. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I am going. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. You see... What's going on here is that Jesus is having his final conversation around the table. They have washed one another's feet, or he has washed their feet, to be more accurate. They have drunk together. They have eaten together. They have received the promise of the new covenant. And now it's his parting conversation. What I want to do with you in the next few minutes is just take a few highlights out of the next few chapters because it goes all the way from chapter 13 to the end of chapter 17 around the table. Yes, they at some point do get up and leave the table, but they are still, as it were, journeying together, having the same conversation. And so I'm going to take you through a few highlights, starting with this one. Jesus says, the cross is the hour of my glory. It's where my character will be revealed. And what I have done for you in laying down my life, I want you to understand it's supposed to be practical in your life. Salvation is not just a theory of the truth. It's not just the story of what God has done for us. It's the story of what God wants to do in us. So I want you to love one another like I have loved you. That is the practical effect of the true gospel in our lives. The true gospel lays competition in the grave. It lays pride in the grave. The true gospel compels us to move towards others selflessly. The true gospel enables us to forget about ourselves and our well-being and our desires and our ambitions and our preferences. And it enables us to lay that in the ground and link arms with others. It enables us to cooperate. It enables us to seek the best of other people. That's what the gospel does that's what it's supposed to do he carries on in chapter 14 verses 1 to 4 do not let your hearts be troubled trust in God so trust also in me there is more than enough room in my father's home if this were not so would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you when everything is ready I will come and I will get you so that you will always be with me where I am and you know the way to where I am going. Of course, I said, where are you going? How do we get there? I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. 
a statement of exclusivity, a statement that Christ needs to be in our lives supreme in all things. That we understand that salvation is not a ten-step or ten-commandment ladder that we can walk ourselves up to so that we can measure up to the goodness and the love of God. No, 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 no. The only way into the kingdom is through relational reconciliation with Jesus Christ. The only way in is to be friends with Jesus. Salvation isn't about how well you perform. It's who your best friend is. It's who you know. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And his promise is, I'm going to die for you. I want you to love others the way I have loved you. And keep in mind that I am coming again to fetch you. Your security in awaiting the coming of Jesus is not how sinless you are. It's not how perfect you are. It's not the, the closeness that you have attained to my perfection. It's your friendship with me. It's your fellowship with me. It's the sitting around the table with me. It's entering into conversation with me. It's surrendering your heart and your life to me. It's letting me dwell in you and through you. And yes, by the way, when that fellowship is happening, guess what? You will rise to become like Christ. You will find yourself coming into harmony with his commandments. Jump down a few verses here. Chapter 14, verses 15 to 31. Rather lengthy passage, but a powerful passage. If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you, or another comforter who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father. You are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them, and reveal myself to each of them. Judas, not Iscariot, but the other disciple with that name, said to him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the father who sent me. I'm telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. I'm leaving you with a gift peace of mind and heart and the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give so don't be troubled or afraid remember what I told you I'm going away but I will come back to you again if you really loved me you would be happy that I'm going to the father who is greater than I am I've told you these things before they happen so that when they happen you will believe I don't have much more time to talk to you because the ruler of this world approaches he has no power over me, but I will do what the Father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the Father. Come, let's be going, he says. And they get up from the table. I am coming again. The way into the kingdom is through me. Did you notice the relational language? I will abide with you. We will make our home with you. What we want you to do is enter into covenant with us. The Father, the, the, Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit saying, we want you to enter into a relational covenant with us. We want you to fellowship with us. We want you to be agreed with us, to walk hand in hand. And can two, can two walk together unless they're agreed? The obvious answer is no, right? We want you to obey us. We want you to submit yourselves to us. We want you to live not as your own authority, not as autonomous, not as a law unto your own being. We want you to live the way we live in love and subservience to one another. We want you to enter into this relational covenant so that we can make our abode with you. Before you ever enter the physical kingdom, the final kingdom, the consummated kingdom, before you ever get there, you can know the fellowship of the kingdom today. You can know the presence of the Holy Spirit today. I'm going to send you the third person of the Godhead. 
I'm going to send you. The Father has given the Son. The Son is going to lay down His life, but He must return to prepare a place in heaven. And in the interim, as we're separated from face to face, from eye to eye contact, I'm going to send you. You won't be orphans. You will not be abandoned. You will never have to walk alone. The power, the presence, the person of the Holy Spirit will be with you. He will lead you into all truth. He will remind you of the things that I've said. You will not be alone around the table. John chapter 15 continues this way. Yes, I am the vine, Jesus says. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do how much? Nothing. 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 A statement of complete dependence. You are at your safest place spiritually when you realize your bankruptcy. You are at the safest place spiritually when you realize that everything that needs to happen for salvation in you will happen because of the presence of the abiding Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. You are at your safest place when you are completely surrendered to Him. You are at your most dangerous place when you think you're about to arrive. You are at your most dangerous place when you think that you've been walking with the Lord for so long now that I think I'm getting it by myself. I can just carry on. It's become a habit. I know how to get up and go to church on a Sabbath morning. I know what the commandments say. There's probably not much more for me to really learn about those things. Not much deeper to go. I mean, I get it. I get what it is. And you know what? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. When you think you're doing all right, I know two things. I know, number one, you're comparing yourself with somebody who's worse off than you. That's the only way you can think. That's the only way you can think you're doing all right. Is you're looking at the guy who's worse off than you and going... Hey, maybe I'm not so bad. You've got a false standard. The second thing I know is you've lost sight of Christ. Because Jesus is the only true standard. And when all of us stand next to Jesus and look at the measure of righteousness and of character in Him, no matter how much higher up you are than the rat bag down there, you still fall horribly short. For all have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. So in those moments where you have that... That, 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 that deceptive, comforting feeling that you're doing okay. I'll be willing to bet you that if you search your heart, you've stopped looking to Christ and you're looking at people around you. And that's giving you a false sense of security. You see, He is the vine. We are the branches. Every success you'll ever have in ministry is because it is Him who ministers through you. Every success you will ever have in becoming Christ-like in character is because He is living in you. Everything that you need is found in Christ. And He uses this agricultural metaphor. We understand what happens to a branch when it cuts itself off. Or when we cut it off, right? We understand when a branch or a leaf falls to the ground or, 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 or a bunch of grapes lands on the ground. They may look all right for a while, but it's not long before they're becoming deflated, soft, fermenting. They're rotting. They're decaying. The moment you're not connected to the, to the stem, you are decaying. Jesus says, you need to be in me. You need to be connected to me. You, it's not enough to know about me. It's not enough to understand the doctrines of the church, to understand the doctrines of Scripture. It's not enough to be busy with missionary endeavor. You and I, we need to be sitting around the table. You need to be grafted into me. You need to be connected with me. That's why we eat the bread, because we take Christ into us. That's why we drink the wine, the unfermented grape juice, because we take Christ into us. The bread and the wine fuels the body physically. Christ fuels the soul spiritually. That's why we engage in that ceremony and in that ritual Because you must receive him in to you You'll you'll hear that language all the way through these chapters I in you, I in the Father, the Father in me, us in you It's not not just next to, it's not just in association with It's this, like how how much more, how much more intimate can you describe this? How much more, how much more of a connection? No, no, it's not just that we need to be, have have a touching moment No, 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 we need to be connected with one another My life needs to flow through you John chapter 15 verses 9 
to 14 says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Let me pause there for a moment. Did you see that the commandments do not merit you anything? Do you see that obedience does not earn you anything? No, it's simply a way in which we remain in connection with him. It is the way that we remain hand in hand. Can two walk together if they are not agreed? The commandments are the, are, are the, the description of the character and of the love of God in the way that we relate to God and we relate to others. He says, so it makes sense that if you and I are in fellowship and if we are in friendship together, then as you, are, as you obey my commandments, as you walk with me in my commandments, we will remain in agreement our friendship will not be tested we will remain on the same page i have told you these things so that you will be filled with joy yes your joy will overflow this is my commandment love each other in the same way i have loved you there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends this is his challenge to you and me around the table this is his challenge to us as we prepare for his soon return, face-to-face -face reunion with him. Learn to love the brothers and sisters that you will occupy the mansions of heaven with. Learn to love the brothers and sisters that you will walk down the streets of gold with. Learn to love the brothers and sisters that you will sit around that grand fellowship table with when Jesus drinks of the grape juice for the first time since the last supper. That's what he said, right? I will not drink of this again until the kingdom of God is fulfilled. Learn to love the brothers and sisters that you will gather around that table with when he himself will serve us. As crazy as that is, just like he did at the Last Supper. Learn to love the brothers and the sisters the way he has loved us by laying down his life for us. Think about the trivial things that get between you and me. Think about the trivial things that get between us. Think about the foolish things we argue about. And then think about the cross. Think about the stuff we fight, with, fight over as parents and children and as husbands and wives. And then think about the cross. Think about the things we allow to divide us. And then think about the cross. If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belonged to it. But you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world. So it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than a master than its master. Since they persecuted me, the master, naturally they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. Jesus says, I, I'm going to tell you right now around the table. A place of honesty, a place of conversation. I'm going to tell you right now. Do not think that Christianity is your ticket to a good life. Do not think that Christianity is the guarantee that you'll never know suffering, pain, or loss. I want you to understand that by following me, it's not the way that you will escape persecution and hardship. I want, to, I want you to know that if you choose loyalty to me, if you enter into covenant with me, if I make my abode with you, if I live in you and through you, if you are coming into harmony with me, then you are ever increasingly out of harmony with the world. Your very life, your very presence, your very demeanor, the language you use, the, the, the attitudes you harbor, the experiences you, you, you cultivate, they are the experiences that rebuke the world. And you know what it's like when somebody tells you off for something? You rise up. You feel that sinful pride within you rising up unless you put it down by the, by the power of the cross. It will rise up and retaliate. Well, that's what the world will do to you. Because by everything you are, the world is rebuked. The closer you come to me, the more out of sync you will be with the world. So if you find yourself in sync with the world, take a step back, look at the cross, and ask yourself, and by still embracing the one who first embraced me. He says, I want you to understand that Christianity does not mean that you will always have justice in this life. In fact, here's what I can promise you, Jesus says, around the table. He says, here's what I can promise you. In fact, because you have chosen me, you will be the target of injustice. You will be the target of hardship. You have a big bullseye painted on your back. The enemy and his followers 
hate you because they hated me. But you know what I want you to do? I want you to love them into this kingdom. I want you to show you, I want you to show them that when they persecute you, you are of a different nature. That you do not rise up in the same spirit that they treat you in. I want that to be the point of difference between you and the world that says the kingdom of God is for real. It's not just talk, but there is power of godliness when you receive Jesus Christ. I want you to know it's not going to be easy. So if you're going to sign up and sit around the table with me because you think that this is the way that you will always get what you want in this world, you're headed for disillusionment and for disappointment. I want you to know so that you won't be disappointed and disillusioned. I want you to, I want you to count the cost. I want you to follow me more than, more than you can know. But I also want you to count the cost. John 15, 26 to 27 Again, he turns to the topic of the Holy Spirit. I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. And you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. The Holy Spirit's purpose is to point you to Jesus. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be Christ-centered. Not Spirit-centered, ironically. If you're filled with the Spirit, you will be Christ-centered. Does that make sense to you? Not only that, but the spirit who testifies of him to you is the spirit that will will empower your testimony to others of the same Jesus. He goes on to say, in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness, and of the coming judgment. It will convict the world of its sin because it would not believe in Him. So they remain in their sin. The purpose of the Spirit is to awaken the need for the Savior. It will, it will uh, tell us about God's righteousness because in the absence of the living Jesus who was the embodiment of the law, the Holy Spirit awakens the conscience to that of wrongdoing and the awareness of right doing. But more than that, the Holy Spirit points us to Jesus who is the person of our righteousness. The work of the Holy Spirit is to tell us of the coming judgment. The passage goes on to say, because the prince of this world is judged. At the cross, he was defeated. At the cross, he was unmasked. And because the prince of this world was unmasked at the cross, defeated at the cross in judgment, so too the judgment of the the final judgment of this world is assured in the victory of God's people. You and I need the Holy Spirit. I want to emphasize that today. You and I ought to be praying for the Holy Spirit Because it is in the presence and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that Jesus comes alive to us. That the reality of His being and His ministry comes alive to us. It is in the person of the Holy Spirit that you come alive in this world. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. Because when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you love the Word of God. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you have courage to follow the Word of God. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will make no compromise for an easy life. You will follow the Word of God and its truth. He will not speak on His own, but He will tell you what He has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever He receives from me. And then finally, the last act, the last part of the conversation. Jesus turns from talking to his disciples to talking to his father. Because whenever you're around the table with Jesus, you're not just in the presence of one another thinking about spiritual things. You are around the table with Jesus, with the father and with the Holy Spirit. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one that you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. Do you hear what Jesus is saying there? Jesus is affirming in the hearing of his disciples that he is the pre-incarnate Jesus, second person of the Godhead. I existed before I was born, is what Jesus is saying. That's what he said to the disciples and to the Pharisees earlier on in his ministry. He said, before Abraham was, I 
am. I am the God of the Exodus, the one who raised up Moses. I am the one that birthed the Israelite nation. I am the one that became man in order to reconcile humanity with God. Because reconciliation happens not merely at the cross as, a, as an act of God, but reconciliation happens in the being of Jesus, the one who is fully God and fully man, not half of each, because then he would be neither of either. But he is fully God and fully man in one person. Our, our reconciliation happens in the person of Jesus. And in the person of Jesus, our sin was carried to the cross. And in the person of Jesus, our humanity died. And in the person of Jesus, our humanity was resurrected. And this is how you have eternal life. He doesn't speak about performance. He doesn't speak about merit. This is how you have eternal life. That you would know God. That you would enter into relationship with Him. That you would have conversation with Him. That you would sit around the table with Him. One more passage to read. John chapter 17. Continuing with the prayer of Jesus in verse 13 to 21, it says the following. Now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world, so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. Friends, if Jesus prayed like that, how ought we to pray? When you're in the midst of hardship and difficulty, what do you pray for? Do you pray for a change of your circumstances or do you pray for a change of your character? Do you pray for a change of your surroundings or do you pray for a more intimate connection with the Godhead? What is it that you pray for in your difficulties? Because Jesus says, I'm not even going to ask you to take them out of the world. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask you to change the circumstances that they're coming up against. I know that they have to go through those things the same way I have to go through the cross. There's no changing it. There's no escaping it. It is what it is, and it is the only path that we can walk. So I'm not even going to ask you, Father, to take them out of the world, to spare them the pain and the suffering. I just lectured them about how they could expect pain and suffering. Here's what I want you to do, Lord. I want you, when they, when they walk through that valley of the shadow of death, I want you to be the good shepherd that feeds them, that leads them beside quiet waters, that, that leads them into the green pastures. When they're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I want, your, I want your shepherd's crook to be that which supports them and sustains them and protects them. I want them to see you as the God of their deliverance and of their, of their uh, salvation in the midst of what they will go through. So, Lord, Father above, I'm asking you for these believers. I'm asking you, not that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Do you see how important truth is to Jesus? Truth is very important, friends. And here's what I want you to understand. Throughout this series, over the last uh, month or, what, what is it? Three months. Over the last 12 weeks, we have looked at the elements of truth. And I want to put that in the context for you as we close this series. Truth by itself means nothing. Truth does not save you as an intellectual pursuit. Having much knowledge is not what saved you. You're not saved on account of the completeness of your knowledge. You're saved on account of the person who is truth. I am the way, the truth. You see, the reason truth is so important to Jesus, the reason he's praying that we would cherish truth, the reason he's praying that the Holy Spirit will lead us into truth is because every revelation of truth is a revelation of him. When you come up against the truth that's inconvenient, when you come up against the truth that calls for change, that calls for persecution, that's going to result in misunderstanding on the part of your friends and your family, when you come up against that truth that goes against your family traditions, when you come up against that truth and you decide that the cost is too high. Lord, I'll follow you in all these other ways, but I'm not going to accept this truth over here. I'm going to stick to what I've always known before. You are rejecting a part of the Savior. You're not just rejecting, you know, an abstract truth. He is the truth. And the reason he leads you into truth is because in this ever-growing journey of fellowship, he wants you to know him. That is eternal life. 
that you will know him, the one who is truth. You need more than just a great knowledge. You need friendship with Jesus. And that's why even people who don't have as much knowledge as you think you have can still be saved. Because in their incomplete knowledge, they can still know enough to be friends with Jesus. But as you are friends with Jesus and as you have become friends with Jesus, he continues to journey with you in the same way that if your marriage is fit and healthy, you are going to be continuously discovering new things about your spouse until the day you die. They may not be revolutionary things, but you will continue to discover things. Why? Because you're doing things together. You're talking together. You're eating together. You're, you're, you're in life together. And as life unfolds, you encounter new aspects of who your wife or your husband is. There's always more to learn. Same thing when you're around the table with Jesus. There's always more to learn. The reason truth is such an important concept, it's the reason that you must continue to take those steps in faithfulness. Walking in his truth is not because the completeness of your knowledge saves you, but because the Savior who is truth saves you. And if you are friends with him, you will love the journey of discovery. You will love to see new things about him. And you will even love the inconvenience of how that journey calls you to change. So he says here, Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them, so they can be made holy by your truth. Jesus died so that you could be made holy by his truth. He paid the price of his life. So it is no small thing to reject his truth. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. That's what Jesus wants from us as a body. He wants us to walk in the relationship, to love his truth, to receive his Holy Spirit. He wants us to love one another the way he has loved us, to lay down our life for him and for his cause and for one another. He says that as you do this, it will speak of the power of the gospel and the community out there will know that the gospel is real and alive, that it can take this many people from so many different cultures, from so many different backgrounds, from so many different types of brokenness and pull us together in one body that loves and serves one another is a testimony to the power of the gospel so we deny the gospel when we do any less he says by this they will know that you are my my disciples by this the gospel will be given credibility and finally those words to the laodicean church look i stand at the door and knock if you hear my voice and open the door i will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. So without any further ado, one question. Have you opened the door to this Jesus? Have you taken him as your savior? Do you know the fellowship of sitting around the table with him? Have you opened the door? If you haven't opened the door this morning, I'm asking you to make that decision. I'm asking you, you know what it's about. You've heard what Jesus conversed with his disciples about around that table. You've heard him be honest about the reality of life. And you've heard him promise you something more than this world can offer. And so I'm going to ask you a question. If you haven't opened the door, why haven't you? <laughs> If you haven't opened the door and received Jesus as, as your Savior, have you got a better offer? Seriously? If Jesus is not yet your Savior, why would you gamble with your life, not knowing whether you have tomorrow? I'm asking you this morning, 
Will you today make the decision to take Jesus as your Savior? For those of you who have done that historically, I'm asking you today to renew the covenant, to renew the commitment, to be reminded of why you first fell in love with him and to renew your vows to him today. And I'm going to ask you to slip to your knees now as we pray a prayer of commitment. And during that prayer, I'm going to give you an opportunity silently to talk to the Lord and invite him into your life. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, today we as a people kneel before you because it seems appropriate that we recognize our smallness in the presence of your greatness, that we recognize our neediness in the presence of your sufficiency, that we recognize our sinfulness in the presence of your holiness, that we recognize the brokenness of our characters in the presence of your perfect love. We kneel before you this morning, Lord, because we desire to renew a covenant of salvation, a relational covenant with you. We kneel before you to ask of you that you will grant to us your Holy Spirit as a body and as every individual member member or part thereof. From the youngest of us here able to comprehend this, Lord, to the oldest and most seasoned of us here with many years of experience, we pause for a moment in silence that we may each speak to you on our own account. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. It is finished. We're going to invite John to come up. John's got a great song for us. We're going to remain seated, eh, John? You'll know the song when you hear the melody. John's uh, given us some new lyrics to learn. A very fitting song for the end of our series.